and this is Math Matters. Math Matters is an online class for people who want to learn more about math without doing any math problems. It's about how to think about math and how to use that thinking in our daily lives. Students in this class will read uh, books, articles about mathematics, mathematicians, and historical events that involve math. We're also going to watch a few movies with similar themes and talk about them. This is the lecture for the first module of the class. And the topic of this module is enumeracy. Enumeracy is to math what illiteracy is to reading, an inability to do it well. Enumeracy is also the title of a book written in 1989 by John Allen Paulos, a professor at that time at uh, Temple University in Philadelphia. I'm going to begin with a review of uh, Dr. Paulus. Um, book by uh, Dr. Sam Beck, uh, who had at that time, or actually in 2010, something called the Worry-Free Life blog spot. And Dr. Sam Beck wrote, um, Dr. Paulus is not saying that everyone needs to be a mathematician, but rather one must be able to understand the consequences in everyday life of how our society uses numbers. The consequences of enumeracy are not as visible or as obvious as the consequences of illiteracy. Nonetheless, they can be just as profound when they contribute to, a confu to confused personal decisions, muddled governmental policies, and an increased susceptibility to pseudoscience. So with that, let's take a look at a couple current events, uh, very current events, things that are being discussed in today's papers. Uh, earlier today, the Federal Reserve lowered what they call the Fed Funds target rate from 25 where it has been for most of 2000, the last few months anyway, um, yeah, I guess through most of this year, to 2.25%. That doesn't sound like a lot, but the Fed Funds target rate is an interest rate that <clears throat> really just involves banks and the Fed. Uh, directly, but it affects every other rate in the economy. So whether you're talking about a mortgage rate, a car loan, a business loan, uh, a credit card rate, a student loan, etc., this rate has an effect on what those rates are. So it concerns all of us, and uh, that's why it gets the attention it does. And this is uh, just, as I said, a historical chart of those rates over time. But here are some of the things that the Fed thinks about when they decide where to set that rate. These are two measures of inflation. One's more volatile than the other. Um, we don't need to talk about that right now. But these are uh, numbers that are fairly complicated to compute. They require a lot of data, a lot of very sophisticated data analysis, and the Fed employs a lot of people who can do that sort of thing. From your perspective, as a person who's affected by this but doesn't have any plans to become a data scientist, you can understand, with a little bit of uh, background, you can understand more or less how they're getting to these numbers, and certainly you can understand what they mean, so your eyes don't glaze over, your ears don't shut up when you hear information about this coming at you from the media. Inflationary expectations is another statistic that economists care about, um, and that's something that, uh, again, very complicated to compute. This is something called the Global Economic Policy Uncertainty Index. It's what's called a, it's one of what's called a sentiment index. And the footnote describes it as a GDP gross domestic product weighted average, average is a math term, of national indices of the frequency, another math term, of newspaper articles in each country that discuss economic policy uncertainty, another math term. So average frequency uncertainty. When you see a sentence like that, First thing you should think of is, there's a lot of math going on here. Again, you don't have to know how this math works if you have some idea of what it is, and we're going to learn that in this class. Um, this should make more sense to you than it might otherwise. Um, okay, finally, we've got uh, two more things here. The Purchasers Managers Index is a measure of uh, output from manufacturing companies, and you can see it lists a lot of... Uh, uh, countries in the world. There's probably 20 or 30 countries on this list. And all the arrows are pointing left. Left is contracting, right is expanding. So basically what this picture is showing, and this is information that the Federal Reserve has at its disposal, but it's publicly available. 
Um, this is showing that a lot of, con of economies in the world have been slowing down um, uh, over the past uh, year, from June of 18 to June of 19. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that would cause the Fed to think it might need to lower interest rates. And then finally, we have the unemployment measures <coughs> in the United States. So again, you can see there's a lot of math going on here. And that's what people at the Fed do on a daily basis before they, uh, the big headline policy decisions happen. This is a website called Project Syndicate. It has a lot of uh, more detailed articles about uh, current events of, in, in pretty much all different areas. This is an article that came up today. It's called The Coming Clash Between Climate and Trade. Now, this is interesting, again, from a mathematical perspective because both climate science, uh, which involves you know, meteorology, physics, chemistry, uh, I'm not a climate scientist, but I can imagine the various fields that uh, intersect geography um, and uh, trade, which is an economic issue. And we're not going to read this article, uh, but the headline kind of speaks for itself. There is, these are two uh, very large and important topics that involve a lot of mathematics and they're not independent of each other. Solving one is going, you know, solve, we cannot solve one of these without solving the other. That's probably the main point of this article. Um, and so you can see, here's an example of, again, um, most of us hear about these issues at a public policy level. We hear them on the news. We see them on, on, on uh, television news or hear about it on radio or podcast or something. We don't generally hear people talking about the underlying mathematics, but what you want to understand is that behind the scenes um, uh, and behind all the talking heads who will give you opinions on this stuff are uh, hopefully a lot of serious people with a lot of high-level mathematical skills who can really make sense out of these issues. Now, whether or not the sense that's being made by the people in the background is reaching the, the talking heads uh, who reported to us is another issue. Um, we're not talking about that in this course or uh, in this lecture. But these are, again, examples of how mathematics, even uh, if it seems obscure to us or we don't really see it happening, is actually having a big effect on our lives. Now, to lighten up the conversation, I'm a big baseball fan. This is a website called Baseball Reference, and it's got all the numbers anyone would want who wanted to do a statistical analysis of their favorite baseball player or team or whatever. Uh, some of you probably remember the uh, movie Moneyball, which I think starred Brad Pitt, or the book on which it was based, which was written by Michael Lewis. And now uh, that book is sort of uh, the, uh, given, given a lot of the credit for uh, the beginning of the change in the way owners of baseball teams started to think about <clears throat> their portfolios of players and how they wanted to construct teams and how they wanted to play people, and et, et cetera. So we're not going to spend any more time on this, but the point is that everybody who's a serious sports fan is pretty aware that statistics are extremely important in whatever sport they're looking at, and uh, they have a, play an increasing role in how much the players get paid, how the uh, management of the team set their teams up, etc. And so again, I would just say understanding a little bit about how the math works probably increases your appreciation for your favorite sport. A lot of what I just said had to do with statistics, so I'm going to make a couple comments very quickly here about statistics. There's a phrase that many of you probably know, may have used, and it's called Law of Averages. I'm just going to read from Wikipedia here, so it's very clear what the message you should take away from this is. The Law of Averages is the fallacious belief that a particular outcome or event is inevitable or certain simply because it is statistically possible. So in other words, what this means is it's an incorrect idea that something that is possible will happen eventually uh, without going into all the details. The way to think about it is things that are highly unlikely to occur are always unlikely highly unlikely to occur. For example, it is 
theoretically possible. I'm in upstate New York, so we don't generally get temperatures over 100, even in the height of summer. It is theoretically possible that tomorrow the temperature here is going to be 120 degrees. It is highly unlikely. It is so unlikely that it would be a reasonable bet to say it'll never be 120 degrees here, or at least not for the very for you know, for the the way into the uh, future. Um, so, law of averages is not a term you want to use. There is another term, however, called law of large numbers that I think a lot of people confuse. I think when some people say law of averages, they're actually thinking about law of large numbers. And what law of large numbers says is, in probability theory, the law of large numbers is a theorem that describes the result of performing the same experiment a large number of times. So for example, flipping a coin. Um, the way to think about this is, that the message here is that things about which we know a lot. So for example, I already mentioned temperature. If we know a lot about temperature. We have temperature records going back well over 100 years for pretty much the entire United States, maybe the whole world. So our weather people can make forecasts based on averages. And they can say with a high degree of confidence that you know, the temperature here tomorrow, the temperature next month um, is going to be more or less like it has been in the month of August uh, for many, many uh, decades, if not centuries. Any given day can be different, but over time, the average is going to be uh, what we know it to be as long as our analysis, original analysis has been good. So with that, um, don't say law of averages say law of large numbers. I'm going to end up here very quickly just showing you a couple pictures. This is something called the normal distribution. Uh, this curve is sometimes called a bell curve. Uh, this is the most important statistical distribution and it's the one that you want to develop an intuitive sense about. We're not going to do any math in this class. I'm just showing you this picture now. And the way to think about this is that uh, uh, without going into a mean, the mean is average. So this is this is a, a called a standard normal distribution, and the average is zero. And what that means is that things that are let's say near the number zero. So I just sort of randomly put these lines down here. So this is about minus 0.6, and this is about plus 0.3. Well, as you can see, the area in the, between these two red lines, topped by this blue, the blue part of the curve. This is a lot bigger area than, say, the area over here. So what this is showing you is that, uh, in probabilistic terms, these numbers, if you're talking about something that's normally distributed that we measure with those numbers, these numbers are a lot more likely to happen than these numbers. So this is a normal distribution, uh, 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 normal probability curve. And it's the most important number of statistics. And if you start to get an understanding of what this really means, you'll be on your way to understanding all those other statistics we just talked about. And that's it. So we will have more lectures in the future, but hopefully you got something out of this one. And thank you for listening to Math Matters.